California's wine country is assessing the damage from a 6.0 earthquake which struck early Sunday morning. Joining me now is David Oppenheimer. He's a seismologist with the U.S. Geological Survey, joining us from Menlo Park, California. Hi, David. Good morning or evening. Good. We're looking at these pictures. Um, they look quite dramatic. Uh, what type of earthquake was this, and are you surprised at the amount of damage it caused? So the earthquake was what we call a strike-slip earthquake. It occurs on a vertical fault and one side moves laterally with respect to the other side. So it's very typical of the kind of faults that we see in the San Francisco Bay Area. Your listeners may have heard of. And what we have come to learn also is that while you can look at on the surface of the Earth for faults, many of these magnitude six class earthquakes are what we call blind. They don't come up to the surface. There's no indication they're there. All we really know is that the stress is building up and it has to be released. This stress due to plate tectonics and that stress has to be released and occasionally we'll get these magnitude six earthquakes. Okay, and I, I assume a lot of anxious people in the Bay Area right now. Uh, how long do people have to worry about aftershocks and um, potentially how big could these aftershocks be? So we don't have a crystal ball. What we have is an analysis of historic seismicity in California. We call it our generic earthquake model. So when we have an earthquake of this magnitude, we plug in the aftershock decay parameters for this generic earthquake sequence and out pops a number. In this case, immediately after the earthquake, the probability within the next seven days of a magnitude five or greater earthquake was about 56%. 12 hours later, we haven't had that earthquake and the probabilities are already dropping. So now the probabilities are down to 36%. We haven't updated the probabilities yet. What we need, what, what we like to do is collect enough aftershocks so we can actually see how this particular sequence is decaying. And then we'll compute the statistics appropriate for this sequence. We'll do that tomorrow morning. It'll, I'm quite certain those numbers will drop even further because this is not a very energetic aftershock sequence. Okay, and um, David, living here in Asia, we're familiar uh, with an earthquake early warning system uh, through Tokyo. I mean, Tokyo, a lot of uh, residents saying that the early warning system implemented there uh, really did help in the last big earthquake. Um, California doesn't have one in place yet. Why not? We're behind the Japanese. I think what happened in Japan is the Kobe earthquake was a huge wake-up call for the country and they invested heavily in their network. In the United States, uh, we haven't had that catastrophic type of earthquake. We've certainly had big earthquakes, the Northridge earthquake and the Loma Prieta earthquake, but the instrumentation is lacking. So it's sort of like the early days of a cellular telephone network. We have good seismic instrumentation in the Los Angeles metropolitan area and in the San Francisco Bay area. But when you get outside those areas, the instrumentation is too sparse and it's a little bit slow. So we have a beta system running, which performed satisfactorily for the earthquake uh, near Napa, but um, we don't feel we have the instrumentation necessary to release it statewide. Because if we do that, people are going to be disappointed and it's not going to work the way people would expect it to. Okay, but potentially, uh, do you believe that these um, systems, these early warning systems, are worth implementing? Um, that's a good question. Um, the warning for the San Francisco Bay Area, for earthquakes that originate in the San Francisco Bay Area, is going to be very short. We're talking seconds at best to maybe 10 seconds. It depends on where the earthquake is and where the recipient of the warning is. So with 10 seconds warning, we're really talking about automatic response. We're talking about elevators going to the next floor and the doors opening, garage doors and fire stations opening. The most significant one, and I think this is the one that actually would be the huge payoff, would be in the Bay Area, we have the Bay Area Rapid Transit. It's in portions of the system, it's an elevated train. It travels at speeds up to 70 miles per hour. So for every second of warning we can give to the BART system, they can slow their trains by three miles per hour. So if we can give 10 seconds warning, we can slow the train from 70 down to 40 miles per hour. 
And I would say that if we can avert one derailment or loss of life for a train full of people, then the system is well worth it. Okay, thanks very much, David Oppenheimer, for joining us and hoping you have a quieter night tonight.